really happy to, to show you some, some results that we have achieved recently uh, at Pascal about uh, machine learning on uh, graph structured data using a quantum processing unit uh, working with neutral atoms. Um, so why should we care about uh, graphs? Uh, well, because graph data are uh, virtually everywhere. So all the objects that you can see here on this slide uh, can be modeled as uh, graphs. What are nodes are elements and the edges correspond to uh, connections between those elements. So first example is uh, uh, <clears throat> molecules, um, where one represents a chemical compound by a graph. Each node here corresponds to an atom and uh, edges represent uh, chemical bonds between the, the, the atoms. Um, graph also naturally emerge in, in, uh, in the industry like to, to, for numerical simulations of, uh, of shapes, uh, such as in the automotive industry. Uh, also in uh, social or economic networks where the different uh, uh, people uh, share connections, uh, whether that be uh, uh, friendship or um, uh, business connections. Uh, final example here corresponds to uh, power networks, uh, where the, for example, the electricity grid can be modeled by a, by a graph, where the nodes are uh, stations or plants and the edges uh, denote some transmission systems between the, the, the various places. So those constitute uh, some data sets, and you might want to carry out uh, various tasks on those data sets. On those data sets. Um, so for those tasks, they basically fall into two categories, uh, classification or regression. So classification, uh, on the one hand, is the prediction of a discrete output, zero or one, cat or dog, on the other hand, regression consists in predicting a, a continuous value. So let me give you an example for, for more concreteness. Um, uh, on, on chemicals, you might want to determine the activation energy of a protein with a given uh, ligand according to its uh, structural form, uh, its shape. Um, so this is a, this is a regression task. Uh, on social network, you might want to carry out some classification, uh, clustering, uh, determining the, the cluster of people who are highly connected, and that's more like a, 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 a discrete task. Uh, one important point about the, all those uh, graph structured data uh, is that they cannot be exploited as they are by the, the most widespread uh, machine learning algorithms. That's uh, because those algorithms, they, are, uh, they were built to deal with the vectors and not uh, graphs. Uh, they are not optimized to take advantage of the particular uh, structure of, of graphs with edges and, and, uh, and nodes. Um, so this is actually a very active topic of uh, research in classical machine learning. Uh, well, you won't find uh, class classical uh, algorithms which are specifically built for exploiting this structure. And over the last year, we tried to see if quantum computing could help. And we focused more precisely on, on one particular problem uh, of biochemistry. So this, this particular problem is a toxicity sc screening problem. Uh, the objective is to predict the reactivity of uh, chemical compounds uh, based on their structure. So uh, for example, uh, uh, you have two compounds here, and given they, their, their shape, you want to say uh, if they are harmless or toxic, just by having access to their uh, shape, their structure. So this is a, a standard task, and we use the data set uh, called PTCFM, which stands for Predictive Toxicity Challenge on Female Mice, standard data set. So this work is an experimental work uh, carried out on uh, our research prototype at, uh, at Pascal, which is called IROAS. So I'm reporting, uh, so here you have a, a photograph of the quantum processing unit. Um, some figures about the, 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 the study. We, use, uh, qu we used quantum registers with up to 32 qubits, uh, global analog control, no gates. So we'll talk about that a uh, little bit more in, in, in detail uh, later. And in terms of runtime, we took a very large number of shots, uh, given the size of the data set, which is huge, like uh, more than uh, 280 uh, shapes, graphs. Uh, so this amounted to around four days of continuous runtime on, on the experiment. So it's, uh, it's one of the first uh, graph quantum machine learning implementation, a real data set of, of such size. And you have a preprint on the archive uh, that we filed in, in uh, November, and we are currently uh, uh, expecting uh, the results from uh, peer review. 
Um, all right, so that's about it for the for the motivation. So now, about the the outline of my talk, I will uh, before talking about in details about this experiment, I want to tell you how our quantum processors work. Then I'll spend some time describing the procedure, the results obtained for this uh, toxicity screening experiment, and uh, in the end, I will try to uncover some some prospects, some ideas for the future about quantum graph uh, machine learning with neutral atoms. So let's dive in. Uh, so I know that many of you are not, uh, many of you ha are familiar with the most widespread technologies, photonic quantum computers, superconducting qubits, trapped ions. At Pascal, we are developing another kind of quantum computers based on individual atoms. And this is a very promising technology with great scalability potential. Um, so let me briefly tell you how this technology works. So well, um, all the interesting things uh, happen here in this uh, ultra-high vacuum enclosure uh, using laser light and uh, some optics, we can trap one individual atom here uh, at, the focal play, at the focal point of, uh, of this lens. The atom is attracted to the maximum of intensity of the light, of the laser. So it gets trapped in free space uh, by the laser with very little residual motion. It's really standing still in vacuum. So this effect was demonstrated already 20 years ago in Paris uh, and uh, reported in this publication. And uh, for uh, many years, it has been improved and developed. Many scientific developments occurred in various labs around the world, uh, uh, but especially in Paris, in the group of, uh, of Antoine Braouès and Thierry Laé, who are two academic co-founders of, uh, of Pascal. So I have told you how we can trap one atom but this is not sufficient if you want to, to, to build a quantum computer. For that, you need many atoms. So in order to have many atoms, uh, we use holographic techniques and a device which is called an uh, SLM for a spatial light modulator. So before passing through the lens, the tra trapping laser beam is reflected onto this SLM device which will imprint a phase pattern onto the phase front of the laser. And in the focal plane of the lens, this phase modulation will get converted into a desired intensity pattern. So uh, instead of having a one phase relation, phase pattern, you, you have a, a, an intensity pattern in the focal plane of this lens. This is how you can generate several traps, many, many traps. Instead of uh, having one atom, you have many traps, and in each of them, you have one unique atom. So great thing about this uh, holography technique is that it scales very well. Up to several hundreds of sites, you only need one laser to generate the entire array. And another very nice feature that is very important for the, 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 the use case, the, the, the result that I am reporting today, is that you can change the geometry of the array at will, from shot to shot. So the only thing that you need to do is to change the phase pattern here on the SLM, and that will generate arbitrary patterns in 1D, 2D, and even 3D geometries. So each bright dot here that you can see on those images correspond to uh, one unique rubidium atom, which is, which is trapped at a given position. So you can do various shapes and forms. You, you, you can just uh, choose whatever you like. So now we have uh, trapped our atoms. It's time to convert them into qubits to encode quantum information. We use some uh, electronic levels. Uh, the zero state will correspond to one atom. The one state will correspond to, to another, to another uh, uh, electronic state. And to create entanglement, we use a special class of states, which are called Rydberg states. You can really have a, a, a classical picture in mind for those Rydberg states. They are highly excited, and the electron is orbiting far away from the nucleus. So now if you put two atoms, A and B, in the Rydberg state at the same time, they, they will interact via very strong dipole-dipole interactions because the, 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 the electron is orbiting far away. It creates a dipole uh, here around, around the atom A and the same around atom B, and they interact over very large di distances. So that's how the technology works in a nutshell. I uh, will not uh, give more details, but we have uh, some, 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 some uh, details here in, the, in this particular paper, for example, about our technology. Uh, so with lasers, we trap atoms, we drive transitions between electronic states, and we use dipole-dipole interactions to create entanglement. Uh, so by, by nature, all our qubits are identical. Well, atoms, they are all the same. And uh, the, the dipole-dipole interaction that I mentioned earlier, you can use it for to create digital gates, 
but you can also use it in the to generate Hamiltonian sequences in what we call the the analog mode, and that that is the, that will be the the focus of uh, of today. So this type of platform has gained a lot of momentum in the past few years uh, because of uh, successes for quantum simulation problems, where one uses a quantum processing unit to 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 answer some fundamental quantum question. So for example, uh, dynamics of a quantumizing model or, or some things like this. So for example, here re re result reported in, in Nature in 2021, um, where with 100 qubits you can you can. Uh, you can uh, create an antiferromagnetic state of matter. The, the, the experimental results and the theory MPS agree very well for 100 qubits. But when you go to 200, well, uh, you cannot, you can no longer do the, the simulation, but the, the experiment runs in the same time. Uh, so we are beyond what classical computers can do in terms of uh, simulation of the di dynamics uh, uh, on, on, um, in, on a classical computer. And uh, and still, yeah, the quantum computer gives gives some results. Um, and there is a, a large scalability potential as well. Um, we have demonstrated uh, earlier this year more than uh, 300 and, uh, 350 qubits, and uh, we should have we should be able to reach a thousand qubits uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, soon. So that's about it for the for the technology. Um, I don't want to 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 say more. And let's uh, dive in and go to the toxicity screening experiments. So first, I want to underline that the idea of using quantum computing for machine learning uh, tasks on, on graphs is not a new topic. And I'm showing here two early publications on these subjects, among others. There are others uh, out there. Uh, first one, uh, first work using a, a GBS at the Xanadu, uh, where you can extract probability distribution uh, uh, with phot photon counting at the end of the uh, large interferometer. And uh, second work at Google uh, called the QGNN, where variational circuits um, take into account the, the topology of the input graph. So those are uh, works that were uh, uh, pioneering in the, the field. And our work shares some similarities with these studies. Um, the idea is, is to use the quantum dynamics to embed data into a feature space, which is useful for learning tasks. So. Uh, in more details, let's illustrate this idea with a simple example of data points um, living in 2D. So given um, a set of training data, the objective here on this particular example is to uh, find a linear separator separator between the, the, the two classes, uh, red and blue. Um, as you can see, uh, the data is not actually not separable in the original space to, to start with. And in order to separate the data, one maps it into a, another different space called the feature space, making it easier to work with. So an example is shown here, where we illustrate how um, to easily solve this problem by embedding the data into 3D. And you can easily find a, a, a hyper pl a plane here to separate the, the blue dots from the red dots. So the idea of quantum graph machine learning with neutral atoms is very similar. The idea is to apply a quantum dynamics to a set of atoms, which are arranged under the forms of graphs in 2D, and then uh, it, it creates some wave functions, and you measure uh, those, at, those atoms. From those measurements, you can extract some probability distributions. And simply by looking at the shape of those distributions, you can try to separate the various kinds of graphs. So that's the quantum feature map that we use. Uh, it, it bears a lot of similarity with the classical feature map that you can see uh, here on top. So how does that work more in detail? Well, it, let's imagine that you have this conformation of atoms in the plane. Roughly speaking, you can really consider that the dominant interaction terms are those for which the distance between atoms is lower than a given threshold, uh, which as I'll call uh, R0 here. And so that the sum over here of the, of the, of the interaction terms in the, in the Hamiltonian becomes restricted to the edges in the, in, the, in, the, in the graph. So in that way, you embed some information of the graph, so which nodes are connected to the other ones, uh, to, into the quantum dynamics through the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> and after the dynamics, we will then obtain, obtain measurements which are uh, graph-specific. Um, so I'm showing here uh, uh, two examples of probability distributions that are obtained for various graphs that are shown here in the inset. So I'm showing the, 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 what is the observed probability to measure a given number of excitation for one graph here and for another graph here. 
as you can see they are quite they look they look quite different that's because the structure of the graph has an impact on the dynamics and comparing the measurements histograms uh, enables you to 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 build the similarity measure between the graphs you can you can say but just by looking at the histograms if two graphs are more similar than than two other ones so we do that using a standard measure of distance between probability distributions which is called the jensen shannon divergence and uh, uh, it is relatively it is a very standard tool to measure uh, the simil uh, similarity measure between uh, probability distributions <clears throat> uh, so in our case, the PTCFM dataset is composed of chemicals, so chemical compounds which are represented under the form of graphs. So for each graph, the nodes correspond to the atoms of the compounds, and the, the edges indicate the chemical bonds between those atoms. And the task is to predict the reactivity of the compound based on the on the graph structure. Is it harmless? Is it dangerous? So in the original uh, uh, data set, you have some, some uh, node labels, that, but we discarded those in, in our study because uh, uh, we were not able to, to encode that in, in information uh, uh, in the quantum processing unit. So you can see examples of those compounds of the PTCFM data set on the screen. And uh, now here are the fluorescent images corresponding to the hardware implementation that we did uh, uh, on our uh, the quantum processor. So here, each dot, again, corresponds to one unique uh, atom, and uh, you have a, a distance of uh, around uh, five, six micrometers between, uh, between two atoms. Um, another example of a large uh, 32 atom graph that was realized. Um, so let's go to the results. Well, the first result that we obtained is that the quantum procedure achieved the classification performances which are on par with the, the standard classical kernels. So you can see a summary of the obtained scores in this table. We show the F1 score, which is a metric to quantify the performance of the classification for various kernels. Uh, the quantum evolution kernel, which is the procedure I, descri I described, achieves a, a, a relatively good score, uh, which is uh, comparable to the best performing classical uh, kernels. So that's very interesting. Then we wanted to, to understand a bit better how the kernel behaved. So what were its characteristics? So to do so, we, we can have a look at the kernel matrix. So at the position i and j of this matrix, uh, you will find the value of the kernel uh, between graphs indexed by i and j. So yellow color means large similarity between graphs, and blue color means low similarity between graphs. One thing uh, that is important to know is that the, the indices are sorted by increasing graph sizes. So small graph on the top left, and large graphs on the uh, bottom right. On the top part, we show numerical simulation values, and on the bottom, experimental values. So first conclusion, very good agreement. So that's, that, that's lucky. We understand very well what's happening on the experiment. Um, uh, so that's a, a, good, a good conclusion. And then we wanted to understand more what, what, what meant this shape. So we tried to look at uh, other kernel matrices. So I'm showing here the kernel matrix for SVM theta which is the second best performing kernel. As you can see, both kernels have a particular feature, which is the emergence of a size-related diagonal blocks, where graphs of the similar sizes uh, share a lot of similarity. Uh, so the, it means that the models ident identify the size uh, of the graph as, as an important feature for classification. So it's, uh, it, it's something which, is, which seems to be an important feature. And looking more closely at the data set, uh, we indeed could, could see that uh, the data set is relatively imbalanced, size imbalanced, as, uh, as you can see here. But of course, you can see that so quantum evolution can recognize sizes as a good uh, feature, but the score achieved is, is, is even better. So they are, they are, they are, they are, they, it, it goes beyond size. It also uh, see other things. So there are other ways to estimate the performance of the, of the method a little bit more quantitatively, and that's what we, we try to do um, uh, later. Uh, so to characterize more precisely the performance, how, we, uh, how well the, the results were, um, we, we used the technique to compare uh, the geometry of the feature spaces associated with kernel methods, as was proposed in a recent work uh, by, uh, by, by Google. Uh, the idea uh, is to define a metric called the geometric difference, which is defined here. 
So these quantity measures the, the difference between how kernels K1 and K2 perceive the relation between data points and labels. So more precisely, it, 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 it tells you, uh, it, it characterizes the, the, the disparity regarding uh, how each kernel maps data points into their respective feature spaces. So uh, in our case, we'll take K1 to be uh, the quantum evolution kernel, and K2 is selected uh, from a set of classical kernels. And if the geometric difference is small, it means that there is no target assignment for which the the quantum procedure outperforms classical kernel. Uh, so in, a, a small geometric difference means that on this data set, there is no way for a quantum kernel to quantum kernel to outperform the classical one, whatever the labels of the data. And on the other hand, a high geometric difference tells you between quantum and classical tells you guarantees you that there exists a function mapping the data points into targets for which the quantum model will outperform the classical one. So estimating the geometric difference is uh, some kind of um, a check uh, uh, that encoding the data into the feature space uh, uh, could not be uh, replicated by a classical model. So we show the results here in this table. Um, so the threshold for high geometric difference is typically the square root of the data set, the size of the data set. Uh, for us, it's around 10, 15. So our, our results are good indication, strong indication of the potential of the method. And to confirm this, we artificially relabel the data, the targets, in order to maximize the utility of the of the of the kernel. So we observe we observed that quantum evolution kernel gets a F1 score with this artificial labeling of around 99% uh, on the relabeled data, uh, while the the, the 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 classical kernels uh, achieve uh, far lower scores. So the best one uh, is 82% even after retraining it on the new uh, new labels. So I'm showing here the, the tables uh, 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 illustrating that. <clears throat> so to summarize on this part, we observed a, a large geometric difference between quantum evolution kernel and other classical kernels, and artificially relabeling the targets of the data uh, uh, enabled us to create artificially a large gap between quantum evolution kernel and the other classical kernels. So, but this is uh, relatively artificial. So it, it, it remains actually a, a completely open question to try to characterize uh, what are the, the kinds of data sets which offer uh, uh, naturally a structure uh, that can be better exploited by a quantum model uh, without having to do this uh, relabeling. So in our work, we try to carry out the first steps in that direction. So we created one synthetic data set on which uh, our algorithm, uh, the quantum, the quantum uh, kernel, uh, is able to outperform uh, classical kernels without any relabeling. So this data set is uh, inspired from condensed matter physics. So we, 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 it's composed of two classes of uh, graphs uh, generated by some walks on a triangular lattice, so class A and uh, class B. So you can see that they are very similar, but they, you can see some subtle differences between uh, some instances of, of graphs here. So on, on this data set, we, we, we observe um, a, a large gap between the quantum evolution kernel and all the other kernels uh, for, 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 for some parameters, where P here is a tunable parameter the, which characterizes the, the, the walks uh, on the triangular lattice. And so you can see, so here I'm, I'm showing the F1 score where, with respect to this parameter P for various uh, various kernels. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, 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 the quantum evolution kernel, which corresponds to the blue and the orange uh, bars, they are uh, often like above the other ones. So it's quite interesting to try to, try to identify such data sets and find some others uh, so that we can more generally guess on which kinds of data we expect Keck to be uh, the quantum evolution kernel, the quantum uh, graph machine learning to be a strong, uh, strong solution. Um, so we also tried to characterize what was original in the quantum procedure with respect to classical ones. So what, what was the key differenti differentiator from a, at a microscopic perspective between quantum and classical uh, procedures. So we realized that the, the quantum kernel is, is, is not only affected by local properties, such as the node degrees, for example, but also more global ones, such as the presence of cycles. And even when you look at single body observables. 
So in these graphs, for example, uh, they, the nodes can be separated in two equi equivalent classes, two classes according to their um, neighborhood. So the, the border nodes, um, they have uh, one neighbor of degree three and one neighbor of degree two. While the center nodes here, they have two uh, degree two neighbors and one degree three neighbor. And uh, it's the same for the, the two graphs. And uh, uh, what, we, what we did is to do the, 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 the quantum procedure. Uh, and uh, we, we, we realized relatively easily that uh, you, ca you can discriminate uh, between the two, the two graphs. That's, uh, that, that comes relatively easily from the, from the presence of interactions. While in the mean field approximation, so if you consider the dynamics at the mean field level only, or at the semi-classical limit, the, the, the dynamics of the two graphs will be similar as, uh, as uh, shown here in the insets. And uh, that's quite interesting because it tells you that this feature really comes from the quantum interactions themselves, pure quantum effects. And uh, so even when you look at single body observables, like uh, and the occupation at site uh, uh, J for edges or center nodes, you can really tell the difference between between one graph or the other one, while you cannot do it with at the mean field level. So it's really a quantum effect. And this dependency of uh, local observables, like single body observables, to the, the, the global graph structure, it's quite in interesting because it, it tells you that uh, that that you can go beyond the, the well-known uh, WL test in uh, uh, the graph machine learning uh, literature. Uh, by only with a simple, uh, simple, uh, simple procedure, and this is quite interesting when you look at. Uh, uh, this is also a subject of interest for standard um, uh, graph, uh, classical graph machine learning uh, um, literature. Uh, so this is really uh, uh, something that, uh, that 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 is interesting for us. We we really want to 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 continue pushing on this uh, uh, on this idea of uh, using neutral atoms for. Um, quantum uh, graph machine learning uh, because uh, we have this unique ability to reconfigure the, the, the array from shot to shot. And uh, well, this experiment is, well, first one, it, it, it took a lot of effort um, because the data set is huge and you have to, you, you have, to, to have many, many uh, runs. Uh, but we are quite happy with the, the first results that we that we got, that we got, and we hope that uh, that, that some some other ideas will emerge in the in the community that we can uh, that we can test uh, on hardware relatively soon. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to to to, to thank you uh, for your for your attention. Thank you so much, Loic. Uh, this was an excellent talk. Um, I I loved seeing the results like I was very impressed by the results that you've got so far so uh really congratulations like saying uh you have a lot of uh like you're almost reaching uh, a thousand qubits right you said you're gonna read them soon and you have incredible results uh so far with the technologies so um um really uh really happy to see uh the results that you have so far Loic uh Congratulations, really, that's the first thing I can say. We also had a bunch of uh, engagement from the chat, a lot of questions, everybody wanted to know more. Um, I'm gonna ask first a completely unrelated question, right? Because we like learning about the person behind the science, but I'm definitely looking forward to the answers that you have for everybody's questions. Uh, so our my first question is, uh, you mentioned that you were chief of ambulance in Paris. so. Tell us uh, how that was, how that worked, and what you did as a chief of ambulance. Oh yeah, so yes, I spent uh, uh, one year as a, uh, the Paris firefighter brigade, like the, the uh, as a firefighter in Paris. And the, in, in Paris, the, the 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 firefighters have two roles, like a paramedic role and a real firefighter uh, role. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a really great year. Um, first time in Paris for me. Actually, I was born in the south of France, and the first time in, in, in spending uh, spending few months and a year in Paris. It was uh, quite an experience, and uh, yeah, very intense, but uh, very quite interesting, uh, quite ex interesting experience. Uh, working in shifts and uh, uh, with the 
uh, a strong team to, to, to try to help um, people in need. Do you have any anecdotes? Uh, something, uh, I don't know, uh, fun, amazing, scary, or new that you can tell us about that experience? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if there are many fun things about that because usually it involves uh, people uh, being hurt or ill. But uh, it's it's uh, the, the, the atmosphere is, uh, is is quite nice, and sometimes you have um you have some interesting parties. Uh, one especially at the during the one one day, which is the the the, the, the the particular day where all the Paris firefighters um, uh, celebrate, and uh, usually, so you we, we go around in the uniforms, and typically people expect pe firefighters to be uh, uh, helping them and always uh, always uh, serious. But that that particular day, uh, there are many of them, and sometimes it's uh, it's quite fun because it you you don't um, you you are not on duty, you're not on call, and 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 you can interact uh, more closely to people and 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 laugh and and uh, and, and share some some things. But apart from that, it's it's relatively uh, nothing very fun, um, uh, very interesting, intense experience, but, uh, but very 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 cool. Really cool, uh, really cool that you did that. Uh, I think uh, volunteering and like the public service aspect of it is really uh, notable. So. That's super cool. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions from the chat, so I'm gonna actually get started with a question from the audience. Everybody make sure to keep asking your questions. Um, our first question from uh, CCES Porles is, uh, do all trapping points in each array um, have one river atom simultaneously generated? Yes, so that's a, that's, so that's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, so in, 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 the, in this setup, uh, we, we can generate uh, traps, and those traps, they can uh, uh, contain at most one atom. So there is, zero, there is never uh, zero atom, there is never two atoms in there. So it, it's really like a, a, a one trap, one qubit in the end, in what you, in what you are seeing here. And uh, so it, it took a lot of work to be able to have a, a, a trap for a single atom, actually. So that was one of the breakthroughs that was uh, that was realized um, actually in uh, in this paper in 2001, uh, where they were really able to see uh, atoms jumping in the trap or uh, the trap being empty, so zero or one, and you can really see it uh, happening in live. Uh, and that's a regime which is called a collisional blockade, and uh, and and yeah, that was the first step uh, towards the building really a scalable quantum processing units with atoms. Nice. Uh, can you have a, like a video of uh, how you see that happening in real life? Is it possible, or do you need to be there in person? Yeah, yeah, no, you can see. So actually, the the. Uh, when you <laughs> when you don't know what you're looking at, it's a pretty boring signal. It's just a, a step function, a, a, a signal a intensity with respect to time, and it jumps between two values. And if it jumps between two values, it tells you that what it's quantified with only zero or one atom. So uh, when you know what you're looking at, it's pretty exciting. But if you don't, it's uh, it, it can be a bit boring. <laughs> but even what you showed earlier, the pictures where you had uh, the different atoms and the different layouts. Uh, yeah. Even if you don't know exactly where you're looking at, uh, I think that's curious and interesting. So let's go to another question. So because we have a lot of them, um, we have some questions about uh, encoding and how you encode node and edge values in the graph. Maybe we can say a couple of words for the people asking about that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Perfectly. Uh, so I, I actually, so when you have you have your 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 graph, and what we what we consider is a, a data set uh, where the, the the data is not uh, the nodes and the edges are not labeled. Uh, you only have uh, nodes and edges uh, with weight one for all the edges. Um, so that's the data set we used, and in in that way, the 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 the, the Having an edge between two nodes corresponds to having a interaction between two atoms, dipole-dipole interaction between two atoms. So of course, there, there are some data sets for which you really want to, to have access to the node and edge features. 
and we are trying to find ways to encode this information into the quantum dynamics. Uh, so there are ways of doing that. Uh, uh, and that's a very interesting and important point for the future. Uh, to, to, to be able to extend the method to more general data sets uh, which, have, which require this, uh, this information. And actually talking about extending, uh, we have a question from TMP321. Is the procedure limited to planar graphs? So, <clears throat> so yeah, that's a very good question. So right now we are, so as you can see on the screen, you can do 3D graphs, but right now our, our QPU only works in 2D. And so the, the way we, we make uh, the atoms interact um, uh, is local. So typically uh, you have this, this, this criterion where you have an, an edge between two atoms if they are, their distance is smaller than a given threshold. And this restricts uh, by default, by construction, the class of graphs that you can embed. Uh, those graphs, which are here, are called unit disk graphs. So it's a special kind of graphs uh, that you can draw in 2D and for which there is an edge between two nodes if the distance between them is smaller than a threshold value. So exactly this. And um, uh, so it, it happens that the, for, the, for the, the data set that we use, the PTCFM data set, you have chemical compounds like this, and, or this one or this one, and they have, <laughs> they have uh, some, you need this structure uh, uh, because they correspond to real molecules living in space, which is 3D, but works well in 2D to draw them. Uh, but of course, if you have general graphs which don't live in 2D, for example, like uh, uh, social networks, well, then it's, it's, it doesn't work uh, as it is right now. You, so you must find new ways to, 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 to embed the data. So the very good question. It's one limitation of the approach right now, yes. Yes, excellent, excellent question. Um, let's go now to our next question by QMA Than M. Um, are there benchmark comparisons for neutral atom computing versus other types, say superconducting computing or for graph problems and VQE? Yeah, well, that's a, that's, that's a good question. So uh, it really depends on what you want to do. So t t I, I really believe that uh, uh, you can do specific algorithms, specific applications on various quantum processing units and you need to take into account the strength and the weaknesses of the quantum processing units when you develop the application. And for us, uh, being able to rearrange the atoms is one key strength. So that's why we focused on graph machine learning, quantum machine learning. But for another application, you might want to go to trapped ions instead because it's, uh, I don't know, you need a high, uh, all to all connectivity and very high fidelity to qubit gates, or you can you can go for superconducting qubits for another one. I, I really think that um, it's hard to compare the platforms between them uh, at the moment. Uh, photons have their own advantages, atoms uh, have their own advantages, and uh, to me, the, the in the short term, all the good results that we will obtain will be uh, special algorithms developed on special platforms. Yeah, I think that's a key message. Uh, not all technologies are good for everything and some are better for others, for certain things, right? And uh, yeah. the results that you show are very promising with their like advanced and limitations. So knowing those uh, limitations is important for the different technologies. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question from Dentucky Kirby. There's a lot of hype in condensed matter physics surrounding Rydberg atoms, mainly spin liquid behavior. Do you have any collaborations with condensed matter groups that study Rydberg atoms more theoretically? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah. So, so in the originally those uh, those platforms, um, uh, neutral atoms, they have been developed to study quantum simulation problem. That that was historically the the the, the way the, the those platforms uh, were developed because it's, it's, it's naturally well suited to, to study the dynamics of um, spin models in various geometries. And if you have frustration, like in a triangular lattice, you can try to, to have a, or a Kagome lattice, you can have some, some emergence of a spin liquid. And uh, I think that is uh, still the, the most successful um, use case for the moment uh, with those uh, platforms. 
to study physics, uh, quantum physics, and uh, quantum spin liquid. There has been some papers, some uh, experimental demonstrations. I, I think it's not the end of the story at all. And and at Pascal, we 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 really think that it's uh, important to continue working with the uh, with the academia, with condensed condens matter physics people. Uh, we have some people doing that internally as well um, at Pascal. Um, and and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's very promising and one of the maybe no the first application without any doubt of of those devices because it's already providing results that you cannot access otherwise using classical methods and it's completely out of reach, so it's a uh, it's pretty cool for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now we have some questions, uh, like a little bit about the technicality of how the systems work, right? So you mentioned you have these optical tweez tweezers, but Juan Camilo, 3148, asks, how do we apply gates in specific atoms of the array? Like maybe pi or two by pulses, how do you control where the uh, array, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where in the array the gate is applied? For instance, a CZ gate. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. So th typically we, we use, um, to control the electronic states of our atoms, we use laser light. So you can focus a laser beam at the level of a, a micrometer to address one given atom only. And if you if you shine a specific amount of time, it will do one rotation with a specific angle, which is specified by the time during which you you, you the light was uh, was on. So that's why that's how you do single qubit gates on a particular on a particular qubit. And you can you can by making a, a careful sequence of gates between uh, between uh, a careful sequence of uh, pulses, light laser pulses on on two atoms that are close by, you can realize the CZ gate. Um, so uh, I the, the, there are some details about that in in uh, in, in in our paper uh, published in Quantum uh, already two years ago. Um, that you you can really directly uh, go there and to have more um, more uh, understanding of how it works, but uh, yeah, essentially laser light focused at the individual atom level, and that's how it works. Okay, uh, so we have again more questions. I'm gonna keep them coming. Um, Hitesh Naval uh, first congratulates you on the great work, um, and he asked for recommendations of resources for. Uh, learning machine learning graphical with quantum computing. So yeah, graph machine learning with the quantum computing is relatively new, uh, I would say. So there are a few few papers, uh, but uh, so we tried to 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 have uh, to cite the relevant literature in our preprint. Uh, there might be some others. But I, I recommend uh, you you try to to have a look at the various references that we that we list here in this uh, in, in this paper uh, and 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 the references uh, inside those papers. But oh, there is no it's 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 a it's a very new field, so there is there is no review paper or anything for the moment on this. That's a very good point. Uh, looking at the cited papers in a specific a specific paper is a very good way to go. So by going to this preprint on the archive, you can look at the resources that uh, Loic and his team uh, have uh, there for you. That's a really good way of doing research, seeing who uh, who cites uh, what's uh, what other sources are cited in the papers that you are reading. Uh, let us go to uh, another question. So we have a question by Ravi Minas. Have you looked at any centrality measures in your analysis of data sets? Um, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. I understand what it. What. 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 Uh, what. What the uh, centrality measure means. Uh, so, if the person asking the question, Ravi Minas, you can clarify in the chat. Uh, maybe we'll get the chance to to answer it better. Uh, that would be that would be the best. Um, we have a question about uh, one of your uh, slides. I think it was slide 18. Um, so bit 101 asks, uh, is there a need for the type of classification visualization you used with a graph indexes split diagonally? So could you repeat the question? I think this question? is the slide. So yeah. what is the name of this graph uh, that you're uh, visualizing? So it's, it's the, the, the kernel matrix. 
So you can um, so so you can build a, a kernel matrix which uh, roughly tells you how similar two graphs are, and uh, it's the measure of similarity that you that you create with the the, the, the quantum feature map. So uh, and and the, the so at at position i and j, you will find the value of the similarity between the graphs i and j, uh, and if it's blue. It means that the, the 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 algorithm perceives a low similarity between the graphs, and if it's yellow, it, it tells you well those graphs are look alike; they they are similar. So it's uh, it's it's really the a visual way of uh, uh, yeah seeing how what is the map which is created, what is the distance landscape which is created by your algorithm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the person uh, where we need a uh, clarification for their question, make sure to uh, clarify your question in the chat. Now we have a question by somebody else. Um, Andres Su Lead, uh, what types of machine learning problems do you hope to solve in the future? <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's a, that's a, that's a very good uh, <laughs> question. So we don't we don't know everything for the moment. We have some what we want to do on this. Uh, we have a clear ideas on on graph machine learning. Try to extend the toolbox. So as you pointed out, uh, some 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 people pointed out there are some limitations and uh, about the class of graphs, features that you can encode. And we really want to 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 make it more general, uh, make it more more powerful, to add some new tools to this toolbox. So in order to be able to to, to tackle graph machine learning in in in, in its uh, all generality, so that that that's really uh, uh, one important thing that we want to do on this uh, on this particular uh, graph machine learning field. Yes, and as you showed in uh, one of the first slides, uh, graph problems can be applied to so many domains. So the mm. possibilities are huge. And uh, it's more about keeping developing the technology and the algorithms and getting good results in other fields. Um, okay, we are gonna go with one last question. So this question is by Quantum Learn. Does Pascal use the same technology as QERA? Uh, so it's it's based on the relatively close technologies. So uh, two two of the main groups that have been developing uh, academic groups who have, who have been developing uh, these technologies are Institut d'Optique, uh, close to Paris, and also Harvard. And uh, Harvard, uh, uh, there is a company that spun out of Harvard, which is Quera. And uh, Pascal span out of uh, the, the Institut d'Optique, so in Paris, uh, from the Paris group. But yeah, the, the, the two, two academic groups were uh, pushing the technology uh, in parallel. And yeah, it's, it's relatively similar. We use the same atoms, rubidium atoms, um, the laser sources, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very close. Uh, not exactly the same devices, of course, but, uh, but the technology is, 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 looks alike. Well, thank you so much, Loïc. This was an excellent talk. So everybody stay here connected for a couple more minutes. But Loïc, I'm going to say goodbye. But this was an excellent talk. We learned a lot. So um, I hope you have a great uh, night, I guess, in Paris. Um, or everybody else, just stay tuned for one more minute. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure to, to, to discuss. Bye.